Hey everyone, and welcome to this lesson on modern DevTools. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at a small performance issue on YouTube.com. And to start out, let's quickly highlight what the actual issue is. The issue is when I bring down the search box, I claim that there is a small performance bug. And we are going to take a look at one way of investigating what the bug is and discuss some potential fixes. And by the way, don't forget, you can follow along with these course notes. You don't have to watch the video. The course notes are designed in a way that you should be able to absorb all the information I convey in the video as well. Okay, but moving on as to how does one actually perform a performance profile? Because we have covered it in a few previous lessons in the same course, but I just want to make sure the idea is solidified in your mind. First of all, you want to identify the action which might be a bottleneck. In this case, we've identified that it could be the auto suggest. But in your case, it might be scrolling of the page, maybe opening a drop down menu or resizing the browser. For step number two, once you've identified the action to record, you want to actually start the recording and make sure you have CPU throttling turned on. Otherwise, your results are, well, they're not as useful, should we say. Because remember, you're going to be on a high end developer machine, most likely. For step three, you want to trigger the action that you identified in step one. So that might be scrolling the browser. In this case, it will be triggering the auto suggest. Then you want to stop the recording. And finally, you want to analyze the results. And in this lesson, we're going to go through all those steps. To start out, let's look at the performance profile of a recording. OK, I've got a screenshot here. Um, all of these course notes do have screenshots. So you can follow along that way in this case. Let's do this in real time. So open up DevTools. Try and make that a little bigger. Yeah, that's good. Zoom in and make sure that CPU throttling is turned on. Again, the usefulness of your results is pretty questionable if you don't have this turned on. I'm going to trigger 4x CPU throttling. OK, then what I'll do is I'll start recording, click, type in a character, and then stop the recording. OK, um, I'll also use the shortcut Command E to start the recording, type in a letter, stop the recording. OK, cool, job done. And already, we've got some stuff to look at. Um, and in fact, it can be pretty overwhelming, which is why I recommend keeping your recording short and sweet so you don't have so much noise to get in the way. But also, benefit from this overview over here. This overview over here makes life a lot easier for us because it means we can just select fragments that we might be interested in and then research further. Of course, you don't want to select portions of this which have a lot of white space because chances are you don't really have a performance issue here. But this big mountain, or more like a rectangle, is, yeah, it's pretty bad. Um, we can immediately see that that frame took over 400 milliseconds, which is incredibly slow. And of that 400 milliseconds, 351 of that was spent on just the rendering alone. Scripting was a lot less. It's not always the case, so you need to have a look at the summary pane carefully. But yeah, in this case, rendering was pretty intense. And why is that? Again, make sure you zoom into portions of the performance timeline, the portions that make sense, of course. And then you want to start investigating the various records which are present. So here I see that there was a recalculate style. So if we click on that, you get more details in the summary pane. Right, every time you click on a different record, you get all sorts of metrics and measurements. But we're only interested in this recalc style because, again, it really did take quite a long time. And in there, you see total time, self time, elements, pending initiator. We'll take a look at some of these in a sec. But one thing to pay attention to is DevTools, more often than not, will be able to link directly to the line of code which caused this particular event to occur. OK, and that's a pretty powerful feature. So here it's saying there was file common.js line 210. And we can click on that and go straight to the source code. It's all minified, unfortunately. So it does make debugging a little trickier. But DevTools does have pretty printing built in. So we'll click on that. OK, great. So now all the code has been pretty printed. It's still not going to be completely straightforward to debug. But there are some tricks we can use. To start out, and generally what I would do in this situation, is I would just tear at the code a little. I mean, it's not very scientific, but the truth is we have to use our combined experiences as web developers to try and apply some common sense and figure out, well, what could be going on here based on what I do see? And in this case, we can see if I zoom in a little, 
we can see that it's checking if a classless property exists on this variable called a. And then if it does, it calls a remove method on it and it passes b. So it's fair to say, for those of you who have used the class list API, that this line of code is all about adding a class to an element. Unfortunately, that doesn't really answer the question as to why recalc style took so long. I mean, it kind of answers the question as to why it occurred. Normally when you're adding and removing classes on elements, the browser has to do a recalc style to figure out what CSS, if any, needs to be applied to such elements. But again, we don't know why it was so slow. So what I would do is I would set a breakpoint, right? So add breakpoint right here. And then you get this blue marker in the line gutter. And what's cool is normally in this situation, I would reload the page and wait for the breakpoint to trigger. But in this case, I can just, you know, trigger that auto suggest again. So I just clicked in that input box, pressed a character, and now we've triggered at that breakpoint. Cool. And another nice feature that I really like is DevTools is smart enough to find the variables of interest. In this case, we have two important variables of interest, uh, A and B, and that's because they are directly used in this function, they're in scope, and they are passed as arguments to this function also. DevTools has detected that and it presents the results of those variables in the scope pane. Alternatively, if it's not present here, you can hit escape, go into the console panel and start typing in the minified characters representing the variables and you'll also get the result of that evaluation right here. But in this case, we don't need to use the console panel at all. Okay, now it's at this point that you might start to see a pattern. You might notice that B is a class name. Okay, that's why it's being removed from A. And A, in fact, is the HTML element. And you can see that because when we hover over it, the entire page highlights blue. But also if we click on it, just a single click, it takes us straight to the elements panel to confirm that the element is indeed in the DOM and well, this is what it is. All right, let's go back. Now that is pretty much the end of the investigation, but the question is, what information have we learned? Well, we have learned something interesting. We are targeting an element right at the root. That's the HTML element. And we're changing a class, well, in this case, we're removing a class called B, which is no focus outline. And in fact, what we could even do just to get a complete story, if I copy that into my clipboard and I do command alt F, which is a project wide search, I can search for that. And I assume that will be control alt and F on windows. Um, anyway, when you do a project wide search, you get a bunch of results. It's telling you, Hey, I found these resources that contain this string and we'll pick one resource at random. So I'll single click on that. In fact, let's resume script execution. Okay. And I'll pretty print the CSS file. Okay, it's, it looks like the um, the match has gone a bit funny, so I'll just do a search again in this file. Okay, no focus outline. There's the class that was being removed from the HTML element, and you can see what they were doing is removing a box shadow. Okay, fair enough. So we could dive deeper into that, but it's not actually necessary because we have kind of figured out why it's taking so long. Back to the performance panel. Um, this is all a bit messy here, so maybe I'll zoom out just a little bit so I can fit more in. Okay, so going back to that recalc style, that really long one that took almost 300 milliseconds, it's starting to make sense. We changed something so high up in the DOM. Remember, that's the elements panel right here. In fact, uh, let me remove that breakpoint. I don't want to trigger that. I want to show you, yeah, there we go. So can you see how stuff is flashing pink in the DOM tree? Well, that is pretty much showing us, hey, there is a class changing. And where is it? Where's that no focus outline? There it is, no focus outline. So that was what was being removed when I started typing in. But anyway, coming back, you see, we changed something so high up that basically all of the children, in this case, 3,667 DOM nodes were affected. And in fact, when you look at this, it's not surprising at all that the recalculate style was so slow. All right, let's go back to the course notes. I just want to make sure that I covered everything. Okay, so we saw how you could select one of the peaks. In your case, even if you're completely fresh to the code base, you're fresh to the web application in question, the idea of being able to select a peak and then go straight to the line of code that triggered it, which again is in the summary pane, that's quite a powerful workflow. And it's something I like to refer to as debugging from the outside in. Because even you don't know the code, you're still able to get these references to 
various lines of code which triggered events that you're observing. And I think that's quite a powerful feature. But anyway, we saw the ability to select that. We saw how you can click on these various events and view more information in the summary pane. We saw how you can get direct access to the code which triggered that event. And don't forget pretty printing. That's quite a hidden feature there. And finally, at this point, this is where it doesn't get very scientific. It's not like a fixed set of processes that you can just follow. It's something where you have to use your intuition, you have to use your common sense and your past experience to figure out what is the code doing. Try and understand it, not just from a technical perspective, but also from a user perspective. How is the user affected in any way from this line of code? When you set a breakpoint, you will have to, of course, trigger the actions again to have that breakpoint activated. DevTools should show you the variables in scope. And in our example, because it was a CSS class name, you can then do a project-wide search with Command, Alt, and F, or Control, Alt, and F on Windows. And you can hopefully get a better understanding of what CSS, if any, is involved with that class name. And just to clarify on why this was such a big deal, because the JavaScript was changing a class name on the HTML element, that's the root element, it affected so many children, so many descendants, that that fully explains why the recalculate style was so long. And just for completeness sake, as a few potential workarounds, um, please do have a think about a few more if you can. One of these would be just find a new shared common parent on the child nodes that has a shorter distance than the HTML element. Why not go slightly deeper down in the document and for example, change it on this body container or you know somewhere lower. Of course, it has to encapsulate all the child elements which need their CSS changing in question, but there's a good chance that HTML is not the closest parent. And another approach, which isn't great, but it's definitely one way of doing it, is to simply target the elements directly in JavaScript. What I mean by that is if we go back to the sources panel, um, the CSS, was it? Let's do a search for that no focus outline. So here, you know, the benefit of setting no focus outline on a HTML element is we can target one of the descendants eventually. So it looks like it's this YouTube UIX button. Right, and then we can set the box shadow none of that. Well, how about just targeting this element directly in the JavaScript and setting its style property to be box shadow none? You know, that is certainly one way of doing it. It's not how I would personally do it, but I mean, welcome to the world of render performance, right? Sometimes you do have to make sacrifices. Sometimes those sacrifices involve slightly hackier and less maintainable code. And I'm not saying that it's the right way. I'm just pointing out that it's a potential solution. Anyway, that's it for this lesson. Hope you enjoyed it. Just to give some context to this free lesson, um, I do have a course and it's not free, right? So normally you would pay for it. What I thought would be nice to start doing is making a few lessons which I can publish on YouTube free of charge. Um, and that includes all these course notes as well. And hopefully you can benefit in some way. You can give me feedback if you have any. That's pretty much it. One thing I would ask if you enjoyed this video and you would like this to continue, um, in other words, you'd like me to continue publishing free lessons onto YouTube, please do subscribe onto my channel. Thanks very much. I'll catch you later.